Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I discuss geocaching and my adventures with it. This interview was recorded using Zoom and may sound different than other podcast audio. Hello, everybody. Amy here, and I am with Lee Katz, the curator of the Hidden History series of Peoria, Illinois. Thank you for joining us, Lee. Oh, thanks for having me. So, to get started, can you tell us how you got into geocaching? Sure. I uh, used to be a Cub Scout leader back in Wisconsin, and uh, we were at one of these round table things, which happens every once a month, I guess it is. And uh, one of this, one of the Boy Scout leaders came up and did a presentation on this new thing called geocaching. And I kind of was with my other leaders and I said, you know, that's, that's something that we might want to try over in the, the Cub Scouts. And they're like, ah, yeah, you're on your own. So they didn't quite buy into it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a give and take with some people. So I said, you know, I'm going to try it, but I think I'm going to use my kids as guinea pigs first, as in my son and my daughter. And we went out one day. It was, it was pretty nice out. We didn't have any geocaches in our town. I mean, our town was so small, the dot on the map is bigger than our town. So there's no geocaches there. It's too new. So we went into a close by town, uh, uh, New Richmond, Wisconsin, and there were a few scattered among there. And we went for one, it happened to be right behind a cemetery. So that was kind of foreboding. And uh, we ended up finding it. Basically my, my son was four years older than my daughter. So I said, okay guys, I'll look up high. Jared, you look in the middle, and Kristen, you look on the low stuff. Because we didn't know what we were looking for. We didn't even know what we were going to do with it once we found it. So uh, long story short, after about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, we ended up finding it. And I, to this day, I still have the picture of them holding their container. It was a little pill bottle and with some really raggedy camo tape on it. But my my daughter took off with it right there she loved doing it with daddy because well, she's a da daddy's girl my son he liked it for a little bit but when it came down to and anybody that knows you know that has children with siblings you know there's a competitive part there my son doesn't go competition so when she kept when my daughter kept running to the cash or where she thought it was he just said you know what dad this is yours and Kristen's. Don't don't worry about me. <laughs> so we've been going since then. And, and my son tried to do the Pokemon and tried to do Ingress. And I was doing Ingress. So that was our thing. And my daughter and I did the geocaching. Well, that's cool. Did you take it back to the Cub Scouts after that? Uh, I did not. Uh, because I just... Um, the Cub Scouts, I don't think were, I don't think the groundwork was proper for bringing them into it. So I just chose not to. I said, this is really fun, but when you figure five to seven kids doing this mm -hmm. with yeah. probably yeah. one adult, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, that would be chaotic. Looking off the shoulder, and because <laughs> I'm the only app, you know, and it just no. Yeah. However, later on, uh, when I moved back to Illinois, I became an advisor for a group called the DMLA, which is a Masonic youth group. And that time, we had probably six to eight kids. Uh, they were 12 to probably 14, 15. And we did try it because I had the app. One of my fellow advisors with us on this uh, outing had, had the app. So we were able to use them, you know, kind of fanning out that the oh, kids okay. were behind us with, you know, looking over our shoulder and 
And we basically said, okay, according to the app, it's right over there. I pointed and they all took off like a shot. I mean, <laughs> bottle rockets couldn't have moved any faster. They were gone. And they crawled over that structure like little monkeys. And <laughs> is this it? Is this it? So it did work. <laughs> but you have to appreciate the age group. <laughs> yeah. Age can make all the difference. Every bit kids. of it. Yeah, for anything. <laughs> yeah. So what are your current geocaching stats like? As of yesterday, um, I've got 1,417 finds. So I was able to make the 1,400 uh milestone and i submitted it to, to ftf magazine so be looking for it congratulations and, thank you and then also as of 10 o'clock this morning i have 120 hides oh <laughs> we went on outing about an hour away from here to do a uh, ex officio geo tour and while we were there we happened to know the owner of a eating establishment and I asked him if we could put a cache, and he said, sure. So we put a cache, and he says, oh, while you're doing that, why don't you put in there that if, I, if they mention their geocachers, they'll get 10% off their bill. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that went live this morning, and I had a first to find from it, because uh, I got the notice, about 56 minutes afterwards. So Nice. So, yeah. That's nice, sneaking one in this morning. <laughs> so what is the Hidden History series that you have? The Hidden History series is currently 47 uh, caches long, or big, however you call it. And it basically commemorates either places or statues or, or something that's not there anymore. You know, a lot of people will do a geocache regarding history. Oh, this factory used to turn out so many cars and yada, yada, yada. My thing is, I took it a step further, is rather than going to a factory that turns out so many cars back in 1947, I'm taking you to a place that no longer exists. You don't even have a footprint on the ground from it anymore. And through pictures and allegory and, and, and other stories or whatever you want to call it, I can hopefully bring the cashier slash reader back to that time so that if their imagination is halfway there, they can actually see that particular place or idea or uh, like I said, statues, something along those lines. And it invokes memories in some people because some of my stuff goes way back, turn of the century. Obviously, that's not going to invoke a lot of memories. <laughs> but there are some of them that only go back a few decades. And that does invoke memories because I've read in the logs um, I remember going to this place and having a hamburger with my dad and watching comets go by and yada, yada, yada. That's what I'm going for, to bring back the nostalgia, bring back that particular person's memories of a, a, a simpler time, maybe even a happier time, because let's face it, 2020 is kind of the pits. Yeah. So, you know, brings back a happier time in that cashier and maybe they can tell a story to their kids or their friends that would prolong that memory. You understand? Yeah, that's pretty neat. Bringing back the nostalgia and there's always something somewhere somebody goes by and says, Oh, I remember back then when that used to be nothing but yep. whatever, insert whatever. Yeah. And, and in this case, it actually became educational, too, on some respects, because we used to have a power station here called Wallace Station. And for the longest time, I was trying to put a geocache near where Wallace Station was. The only thing that's left is the intake 
uh, tunnels, I guess you could call them. Okay. They're, they're made out of concrete. They're on the river. They're, they're physically in the river. But that's the only trace of this building that's, that's left. They built a beautiful park where the building used to stand. And <clears throat> I, I finally, um, one of my fans actually called me out. He says, hey, weren't you looking to do this hidden history? I said, yeah, but I can't do it because there's no, no places. The whole area is red when I go to place a cache. Mm. <clears throat> and he says, well, um, a spot opened up because somebody archived something. Really? I literally went out that moment and I threw a, sorry, spoiler alert. I threw an LPC down <laughs> like, like, like a, the minor 49er throwing a stake on his claim. And, and I quickly put up a real, real shabby cash page, you know, basically information to follow. And the reviewer, because he's one of my fans, he pushed it right on through. <laughs> nice. And anyway, the reason I say this is because um, after I got to put the cash page together the way it's supposed to be done, um, I had a, a few logs later, somebody came up and said in the log, I always wondered what those structures in the water were for. <laughs> because he either didn't live here or he was too young at the time to know what Wall Station was. Right. So this was educational to him. He's like, that's awesome. I've always wondered what these were for. Now I know. <laughs> so again, it's prolonging that history that nobody would know about otherwise. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to make this series? <laughs> you know, I, it became an addiction, actually. I don't think an inspiration is quite the word. Um, I was... I was with a coworker one day, and at that time I worked third shift, which allowed me to do a lot of the research necessary. But I was with a coworker, and he he comes up to me one night and he says, "Lee, you uh, you're kind of a history buff, aren't you?" I'm like, eh, "Kind of, sort of, not really, but okay." He says, "Did you know there used to be an amusement park in Peoria?" Well, I said, "Yeah, there's you know Expo Gardens." He's like, "No, down on the river." No. He's like, yeah, I read it in a document online and yada, yada, yada. So he gave me access to the document. He basically gave me the web page. So I went in there and I started looking at it. I'm like, this is kind of cool. You know, it's got a, it's got a 60 some odd or 80 odd some odd foot Ferris wheel. It had a infinity eight track uh, uh, roller coaster. It had a promenade full of vaudevillian acts. So we're talking about 1900s to 1920s. And uh, I dug more and more into it, kind of like I had a fever for it, just, just going. And finally, I was able to find uh, a record that talked about the relative position of where it was. And so... I got playing with it. I learned about GIS, which for anybody who doesn't know, GIS is a mapping system that basically, at least in the Peoria County area, it allows you to overlay maps from different time periods to see what has changed and what hasn't. Anyway, by using this and by using the, the what they had as plot coordinates, because you know, they didn't have GPS back then. They had plots. So I was able to go with that, and I was able to pinpoint about where it was. Well, then I got onto the GIS map, and I was able to look 10 years after this place had supposedly got destroyed by a flood. Uh, there was still some uh, evidence of it being there. So I'm like, Eureka, I found this. I found the actual grounds. I'm going to go down and I'm going to look at the actual grounds today, which back then it was three years ago, four years ago. 
And I got down there not expecting to see anything because we're talking about from 29 to, you know, 2016, 17. Quite a bit. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting a lot. When I got down there, I saw the actual pavement of the promenade still sitting halfway in the water where it had been crushed from the erosion and the flooding and time. And I just went stupid. It was <laughs> awesome. And I went looking a little more. I'm like, okay, I found this. Take a picture. I found the, the pavement that I could find a picture of. Um, our library is a real good uh, archive for historical documents. And they had a historical document of a postcard from Alfresco Park. That's what this is called, Alfresco Park. And um, the postcard had color. So I could see the color of the pavement was red. Okay. Where I was standing was red. It was concrete. It was probably 30 feet by 20 feet long. And it was red in, in color, but it, again, had sunk down, had, had fallen, whatever you want to call it. So, okay, there's proof. I walk up the shoreline a little bit and into the trees, and I find what I believe was the iron skeleton of a tabletop that, again, I was able to see in other documents. The, not the tabletop, but I mean the, the entire table where the wood uh, seating was eroded off. It, it had crumbled down. The tabletop was non-existent, but the iron frame was still there. Oh my goodness. So I take pictures of this. I take my cell phone back to my friend at work. And I said, you ain't gonna believe what I found. And I told him all about it. He's like, now what are you gonna do with it? I'm like, I'm gonna make a geocache there. <laughs> to commemorate that, that time period and that information so that it can live long and, you know, and bring back some of the past. He says, that's really cool. So I did. And it just started from there. That's pretty neat. Keeping history alive in some form so it doesn't get yeah. forgotten. So you mentioned there are about 47 caches in the series? Yeah, about that. I'm actually working on a 48th right now. Oh, nice. Are they all in the Peoria area, the greater Peoria area, or in the, the city limits, or where exactly can we find them? Well, part of the problem with geocaching in the 2020 era is the fact that the, the area has become saturated with geocaches. Um, for those first 47, well, for the first 40, I probably did my fair share of saturating the downtown Peoria area to the point where you could practically walk from one end to the other and not touch ground. You could walk on geocaches. <laughs> so I ended up, um, I, I try to put my hidden history caches within one or two blocks of the actual site. Okay. So this was becoming more and more difficult, obviously, because of the saturation of the area. So then I'm like, okay. And, and I've got people throwing the ideas at me. I'm like, I can't do that one because there's three geocaches already over there. I can't do that one. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go out from the city limits and see what else I can find. Well, obviously, the first step is let's go across the river to East Peoria which is a, a sentient government on its own. So I found some stuff in East Peoria, placed a couple there. Um, one of them is the actual founding of East Peoria, which was fun to find. Um, not a lot of people have found that one, hint, hint, but <laughs> it is there and it is good information. Um, but I have sprawled out since then, I've got uh, a couple of geocaches about 20 minutes away from Peoria. 
I've got um, one that's almost 40 minutes away from Peoria. And I'm just kind of going out. Wherever I can find history that's, you know, hidden, I, I try to bring that back to the forefront. So it sounds like there's not necessarily an, an order to the series that you have to follow. It's kind of whatever one you feel like doing. Yep. I, I have, um, I tried when I, when I first built the series, I tried to incorporate at least one major type of geocache, whereas I have a mystery one, at least I have a, uh, uh, I have a lot of traditionals, but I have a mystery one. I've got this, I've got that. The only one I don't really have is I don't have an earth cache, mm -hmm. which why? Cause I'm not the sciencey type. <laughs> I, I just, I just, my thing is history. <laughs> it's not science. <laughs> There's plenty of stuff around here. Um, and to that degree, I was in discussion about a month ago with one of my fellow cashers that is going to put, uh, an earth cache on an area that I had already mulled over as a hidden history, but not as an earth cache, just as a straight cache. So he texted me and he asked me for, you know, more information about it. Hold on a minute. He texted me for more information. <laughs> about it. Apparently I am now the leading expert on this. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> but I was able to tell him, I said, uh, I said, this particular thing you're looking at did, does still exist. However, it's on residential property now. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's private property now. Therefore, you may have a problem. He says, yeah, okay, I got that. But since you asked me about it, it fed the world whiskey capital, which is one of my hidden histories. And it also fed Woodruff Ice Company, which I had mulled over as another hidden history cache. But for reasons previously explained, saturation, I couldn't put the Woodruff Ice Company in there. But he's like, I didn't know about those. I thought it was just a natural spring. Nope. It fed the water templates for a lot of the businesses down here. He's like, that's cool. I did not know about that. <laughs> Teaching without even caching. <laughs> I know, right? So anyway, uh, but yeah, I've tried to incorporate uh, different types of caches into the hidden history. Um, but no, there's no sort of organization to it because depending on what the cacher is looking for is what will trip him to this hidden history. For example, I've got a hidden history that deals with architecture. So those people that are big in, into engineering, they're gonna go totally tripping over this. I got one dealing, as I explained before, with the amusement park. So there's people out there that go for that. I've got one that deals with the uh, past status of Peoria being the world uh, whiskey capital of the world rather. So that's something to drive them there. Everything's got a niche. And that's all I can say. Okay. So you said you have different, you try to do different, at least one of the each kind of different type besides the Earthcast. Do you have any where it goes or Adventure Labs as part of that series? I don't do when it, where I goes because quite honestly, they don't, you've always heard the term what plays in Peoria. Where it goes, don't play in Peoria. <laughs> <laughs> There's one, maybe two, and I just never got into that realm. However, the Adventure Lab, I do have, well, technically I have one, and my wife has one. My wife's came out before mine, if you can believe that. And she has a byline right at the beginning of her Adventure Lab that says something to the effect of, Following in my husband's footprints, I'm going to give you some not so hidden history adventure lab spots. And she goes into various places that 
there's history and they're they're still there but you got to look for it okay they're not widely known um she did a really good job on that one and then when my when i finally got an adventure lab i um just said you know what a lot of people like that one that she did so i'm gonna follow through because i know still more areas that she doesn't even know about <laughs> like where you know the famous place that charles Lindbergh first landed a plane in peoria oh, wow. and this was before his you know his his epic flight but uh there's a place marker for it so I put that in my adventure lab and that adventure lab took on a, a, a lot of people. And unlike my wife's, I was able to put a bonus cache in there, which spoiler alert, it's got a hidden history on it <laughs> because it just so happens the timing was right where the building that I was putting in the hidden history as the bonus cache literally was being torn down at the same time the adventure lab got done. Oh, wow. So those that got first to find on the bonus cache were able to come over and actually see through the building because they had already started knocking it down. Wow. Now uh, it's been about a month and a half, probably two months, somewhere in there. Now you can't even tell the building was ever there. So it is truly a hidden history. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. That's kind of neat watching the hidden history in the making in a way. It's all about the timing. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you said earlier, you never thought yourself as much of a history buff. Do you, you feel like you're a bit more of a history buff of at least local history since you've been doing this series? I have managed to dazzle some people's minds with what I know. <laughs> it's 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 kind of fun because my dad you know every now and then we'll discuss history and he'll he'll start asking me questions about the hidden history stuff and trying to give me ideas essentially and i'm like oh no i already know about that one dad and i give him <laughs> you know i just spew out information that he didn't even know he's like wow okay um never mind <laughs> <laughs> So, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Was I pre, you know, predetermined to, to have the history stuff? I don't know. But since I got it and since I started doing it, it has become a little stronger in me. I could, I could see how it, keeping up with it as much as you have, it's going to kind of foster that, that in somebody. Yeah. I may have been predisposed to start with, but now I'm really, <laughs> I'm really, apparently, like I said, I'm a leading, you know, leading authority of it. I don't know. <laughs> Do you have like a typical type or size of container that you use for your caches or do you have a varied? Um... I, I play all of the field. I've got some, the only thing I won't do is I do not do nanos. Nanos are the <laughs> devil, okay? <laughs> I'll do bison tubes on up. That's, that's pretty much the way it is. I do have the fortune of having a ammo can size geocache literally in the heart of Peoria as one of my hidden histories. And that is saying something because, you know, with the hustle and bustle of Peoria, not to mention the vagrants that come through here. It's, it's kind of impressive that I've got a big cache that people can put travel bugs or bigger items in without having to worry about it. Have you ever had any issues with that cache? I had one, and it's a story possibly <laughs> for another time, but since you asked, um, I, was, I was educating somebody in the ways of geocaching. Um, and when I do that, I take them to where I know there's going to be a geocache. Right. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> so I take her to some of my hidden histories. Well, I get to one and it's gone. It's the one we're talking about right now. 
it was gone. And I'm like, uh, this ain't funny. So, okay, we'll pass this one up. I got to come back to this, come back the next day. Sure enough, it was gone. Well, shucky darns, sensor, sensor, sensor. <laughs> I will have to, you know, uh, uh, disable this one and bring a new container in. So one of my buddies that I am also training into geocaching uh, accompanies me because we happen to be out geocaching in that same area. So um, I said, you mind if we stop at this one place? I just got to throw this geocache back down. He's like, oh, no, no problem. So we get there, and I'm just placing the new container in there, which is not an ammo can. It's slightly smaller. But I just put it in, and he's like, is that your cache? And he points about 30 feet up the, up the walkway, I guess you could call it. And here it is. It's, it's opened up. It's sprawled out like somebody just threw it. Oh, there. my. Yeah. So we walk over, and sure enough, that's the container. Okay. And then we looked into the hole that the container was supposed to be in. Somebody had plucked the plastic gallon-sized bags full of stuff out of the container and put them where the container was, but then through the container. So that's a mystery all by ourselves. We have, no, yeah, we have no idea how that played. The only thing one can think of is a vagrant wanted to use it, but then saw that it had official geocache all over it painted. So maybe he discarded it. I don't know. But in, his, in essence, we brought it back, refilled it, put it back in its spot. As far as I know, fingers crossed, it's still there. Wow, that's that's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. We're we're still both of us every now and then we'll meet together and we're like, so what do you think happened with that cash? I'm like, I have no idea. I'm I'm putting it past me. Yeah, that's <laughs> I can't even think that hard. Yeah, I, I could see driving yourself nuts trying to figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> Leave the stuff right where it was, but throw the cash, the, the container. Crazy. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that leads us to a, an interesting question. Who maintains the caches? Do you maintain all of these on your own? You've mentioned you have some fans of the series. Do they help you out? How does that work exactly? For the most part, um, when I have to maintain them, which doesn't come very often, um, I do try to do them. Uh, if I get two DNFs in a row, I'll go out and I'll check the cache. As far as I'm concerned, that should be a rule and guide for all cash owners. Two DNFs and you're out there checking on it. A lot of people, as you probably know, they don't live up to that, but I yeah. try to. So anyway, yes, I maintain them. However, there are times where one of the, one of the people that enjoys finding these hidden histories will come across one and either the log is soaked, which doesn't happen very often, or it's full. That's that's more normally what happens is the logs are full. They have a they have a replacement log. They'll just throw it in there, and you know, never never think twice about it. And I really appreciate those that do that because, you know, when I started placing caches, I'm like, oh, I'm never going to get to the point where I can't maintain all of these, or you know, maintain the the number I've got. Okay. 112 caches later, it's getting a little trickier. It really is. I can imagine. <laughs> I can only I can only you know suppose what somebody with 500 hides does. That that's got to be just yeah. a full time yeah. job. But thankfully, when I go to place a hidden history cache, I look the area over upwards, downwards, twice. You know twice on one side on down the other and I and I make sure that one it's a viable place two I try to take into account the midwest weather mm, yeah and kind of forward thought 
on, okay, if it rains, where's that water going? Is it going to flood my cache? Is it going to pass by my cache? Do I need to build up the caches, you know, defenses a little bit? And more times than not, I, I hope I can say, you know, confidently that I don't have a lot of wet caches. That's a good way to approach it. Yeah. I think sometimes as, as hiders, especially newer hiders, we tend to forget to look at that aspect of it. I mm. have two caches I've hidden and I didn't know it at the time. One of the caches was in a flash flood area. Oh no. The area had never flooded in the five years that we've lived here earlier this spring, it actually happened. <laughs> Surprise. And we went down there and couldn't find it at first. And so it was, yeah, I just disabled it and said, it's, I have no idea where this one's at. We, you know, got a new container and everything and took it out there. And I started traipsing around the area a bit more and it had actually gotten caught up in some brush about 50 oh, feet out. away from where it originally was. So I managed to find it, which I was really happy because there were a couple trackables in there. So I was able to recover the trackables for the, the owners of those and place them in the, the new container. But it's, it's now chained and staked in place, so it should not flash flood it away this time. <laughs> but yeah, uh -huh. yeah, that wasn't anything that came up when I told them where I was placing the cash at so <laughs> I was not sure they necessarily knew either the people I talked to but yeah that it can be easily overlooked the whole water thing <laughs> yep. yep I had one I had one hide it wasn't a hidden history but I had one hide that my daughter wanted to do with me and we did it and it was to say that it was near the water table, it was. It was very close to the water table. It was in a valley. And uh, I knew that at some point it was going to go away on its own, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And it lived for three years before I finally got a DNF notice on it. Oh, wow. And, and, and the funny thing is, is we have floods every year. Yeah. And I would go down there after the flood and sure enough, it's still right where I put it. So that area for whatever reason didn't flood. Well, three years after I had placed it, it finally went away and I found it as divine intervention because quite honestly, I'm getting too old to come down here. <laughs> and crawl back up to, because by the time I'm up the hill from where it's at or up the banks, it's quite a climb. It, yeah. It's not for the faint of heart. So I find it as divine intervention that, yeah, it's gone. I'm going to just archive it and call it done. That's impressive. It lasted that long in that area. <laughs> exactly. Because every, every time it would flood, I'd go down there right after to see if it was still there. And, yeah, it's still here. <laughs> okay we'll keep going what was the most surprising thing or place that doing this series has led you to find it's it's got to be that alfresco park just alfresco. because it's it's really i mean when i first saw the remnants what few there was that charged my batteries i was i was totally hip on that but uh this past spring springish summer whatever you want to call it i had an occasion to go back down there because one of the local developers uh is a native of this area and he wants to revitalize i think that's the word i'm looking for revitalize alfresco park not as it was, but something a little bit different. Okay. But it'll still be a family-centered, you know, outdoorsy thing. 
So I went down there to basically move my cash and get it out of the way of his construction crews. And when I did that, I happened to be down there when the water line was really low. And it uncovered more stuff for Al Fresco Park that just drove me nuts. <laughs> I took pictures. I'm, I'm a big picture person because, you know, it's going to go away. I yeah. want to make sure I got posterity. So I took pictures. I even wrote an article for the local Peoria magazine, which I later transposed over to an FTF magazine article to, to more in line with geocachers. And um, so you guys, whoever's listening to this, it's, it's in one of the articles of FTF magazine. Uh, I think it was back to the future or something like that. That's what I called it. But uh, it has pictures of the old eight foot thick brick wall that used to be the gate of this alfresco park. It has a section that's lying in the bottom of what I could best describe as a lagoon normally. Okay. It's got a sandbar that goes out into the, into the Lake Peoria and it causes this to be a lagoon area. And the water was so low that that, that structure was actually sticking up to where I could take pictures of it. I could see better the promenade that had fallen in and I could see the supporting walls still standing, which normally you can't see because you can't get out to that sandbar because it's underwater. Okay. So mm -hmm. I was able to look from the water side in on the shoreline and it uncovered so much more of what used to be there. It A was a whole new so, perspective. Oh, totally. And it just, tripped my triggers even more. <laughs> that's I know, it sounds cool. corny, but that's the story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the story, so let's go with it. <laughs> Fair enough. So you just mentioned you had to move that one cache location. Did you have, have you had to archive any others or relocate any others because of similar instances? Um, Let's see, not because of other instances. I have had to relocate because of just heavy muggling. Mm. I, I, I needed to find a better place for it. Um, but for the most part, uh, no, I, I've been able to keep, I think I've only got two of them that I've been labeled a 2.0, meaning oh, okay. that's, it's a re redo. Um, one is the Lost Realms of Glen Oak Park, and the other one, which talks about a sunken garden that used to be there. Hmm. And it, uh, through that GIS program, I was able to see what used to be there many decades after, because it used to have a fountain there, and it had walkways spanning out from the fountain, kind of like a starburst, or a uh, sunburst. Okay. And through this overhead picture from years ago, um, you could still see the grass line of the the the, uh, the fountain oh, and the cool. waterways. And so anyway, I had to redo that one uh, because it was just in a bad place. It, it got muggled right away. Mm. And then I had to redo the Alfresco Park for construction issues. So other than that, all of them are still right where I put them, despite what many cashers have had to go to four <laughs> times to find, even though they're literally right in front of your face, which really, I love when that happens. Those are the most frustrating ones. <laughs> Those are the most entertaining ones on my side. Oh, yeah. They're, they're entertaining for the person placing them. They're yep. so frustrating for those trying to find them. I've... I've encountered one or two of those from the finding perspective and my uh, i'll log my dnf and then i swear the next day somebody's found it it's like son of a gun what one of my fellow cashers swore up and down that this cash was gone <laughs> and it was the peoria cd side which talks about the uh the 
not so wanted area of Peoria. It had prostitution, had gambling, yada, yada, yada. And I'll leave the rest for you guys to read. Um, but he swore up and down this thing was not there. So, okay, I'll go, I'll check on it. It's in a location I could literally see while I'm driving my car by. Okay, so I could see it as soon as I drive by it. So I'm telling him, no, it's there. No, it's not. It's there. <laughs> Look, I've been there twice. It's not there. Okay, go there again. He goes there again. It's still not there. I don't know where. <laughs> so my daughter visits down from Wisconsin. I'm like, okay, we're, we're going to really mess with this guy. So let's go over there. And I want you to find it first before I give you the, you know, give you the where it's at. She finds it right now. No problems. And she's not experienced. I mean, she's got less than 200 caches or 200 fines. So she finds it right away. I'm like, okay, do me a favor. Point to it. And I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> so I mean, totally adding insult to injury on this. So she points to it and I take a picture from the street so he can see it zoomed in everything send it to him over text and yeah he said a few explicitives over the text you just rubbed salt into the wound on that one oh, didn't you <laughs> i had to have fun with it he and i kid back and forth all the time so oh that's great and that's not the first time that's not the first time that a experienced cashier has had to come back four times for something literally out in the open. <laughs> you know what they say, the best place to hide something is right out in the open. <laughs> Sorry, That's spoiler great. alert, everybody. <laughs> I love it. So if you could only recommend, if somebody's in the area and they only have time to do one, what's the one must go do? Mm. I can't really. I can't give you. <laughs> you can't. Because, like I said, it all caters to certain personalities. If you like a mystery, I've got one for you. If you like multi caches, I've got one for you. If you like, you know, really hard ones, okay, I don't have a lot of those. <laughs> because, well, I'm a firm believer that this is a game, but more importantly, it's supposed to be fun. Yeah. How much fun is it if you're spending 20 to an hour, 20 minutes to an hour, looking for a little bison tube? That's not fun. I try to keep it easy. So I don't have a lot of high difficulty ones, if, if any, come to think of it. So I can't really cater to that. But point is, is there is mystery ones. There is multi-cache ones. There's ones in different areas of the town. So it all depends on what you're looking for. Somewhere there's a cache for you in the series. Yep. And there's <laughs> some that are literally within walking distance. You can hit five or six of them if you want to walk a couple blocks. Okay. So, because there's cashers out there that believe very solely you know, that, okay, I want to park and just do them. Yeah. I don't want to have to drive everywhere. I've got those. Nice. You cater yeah. to everything. That's pretty cool. I've tried. <laughs> well, you mentioned you have a, a possible 48 cat in the series in the works. Is that firm set or is it still kind of toying with? Or Okay, well, I was driving by this, this site today on a road that I normally don't go down. Just, again, maybe divine intervention. I don't know. But I looked off to the side. And I'm like, I remember what used to be there. I never went there personally, but I remember what used to be there. And it's now a church. Okay. Far cry from what used to be there. That's all I'm <laughs> going to say is a hint. Okay. Okay. So I drove into the parking lot of the church, and I found a suitable host. And now it's just a matter of digging up the dirt on the location to where I can work with it. Okay. I tried Googling it right off the bat. Yeah, there's not a lot out there for it. It was, it was hint, hint, 
uh, it was around in the 80s. So a lot of my generation will very well know it. But unfortunately, not a lot has been documented about it, apparently. So I might have to dig a little harder on this one. That's why I said it might be a 48th. Okay. So yeah. in the, possibly something to look forward to is a possibly. series expansion. Possibly by the time this airs, it'll be there. <laughs> Well, I hope so. You'll have to keep me posted on that one. I'd love to well, keep sometimes tabs it on takes, the series. Yeah, sometimes, you know, when I'm doing these, when I first started, my research would take weeks. And mainly because I'm learning the, the paths to go down, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that. Now I've gotten to where, to where I pretty much know exactly how to Google, <clears throat> excuse me, how to Google it in such a fashion to give me exactly what I want on first or second try. Now it's to the point where I may have to wait until COVID lifts so I can go into the actual archives mm. uh, in our library. So we'll see. Yeah, COVID's put a damper on several it, things this year. So. It has made it a little more difficult, yeah. Yeah, yeah, life is definitely been a bit different for most people this past year mm -hmm. but and i'll tell you what i've learned some neat tricks in the in the library with the archives <laughs> 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 that i never knew about it's like you can do that <laughs> <laughs> do you have any advice for anybody who might want to do some sort of hidden history series in their area uh, well, I, I actually do have one person that, that is following in my footsteps as it's, as it were. And it's one of them that I was talking about earlier. I had trained him in geocaching and he didn't do the unofficial hundred finds before he wanted to start putting out stuff, but he liked my hidden history so much that he started his own offshoot spinoff, whatever you want to call it. Histories of Bartonville, which Bartonville is one of the suburbs of Peoria. Okay. In fact, it used to be Peoria. It, it used to be part of Peoria way back when. Um, so a lot of the stuff he's going to find can actually be attributed to Peoria. But neither here nor there. Back to the story. So he has taken it upon himself. He's, he's done two of them so far. Uh, two different hides of hidden... Hidden Histories of Bartonville, but he only calls it HOB. So okay. anyway, <clears throat> back to your question is, what you should do is start with talking to either elders or people that have been in the area for a while that, you know, say, hey, you know, what used to be cool around here? What, what you know, what was life like around here back in so-and-so days? And, and see what kind of stories they want to start you on. Um, one of my fans, one, one of my followers, if you want to call it that, uh, we met for caching one day, and he spewed off a whole bunch of stories to me. One of them stuck. I actually turned it into a geocache because I had enough information that I could uncover that took me well past that point to make a geocache for it. But it started with him telling me a story about his childhood living in this area. He's well over retirement. Let's just say it that way. Okay. He's up there in years. So he's got a lot more experience in this area than I do in this geographical area than I do. So when he wants to bring something to the table, I'm going to listen and, and uh, start with that. And then go into researching, look up articles, look up, you know, stories in your newspaper about it. See what kind of stuff you can dig up through. If you have a uh, historical society or historical, you know, archive ish area in your area, look up that stuff, you know, go through those motions, see what you can uncover. Cause it really is fascinating once you get started. With, without me doing the digging, 
I never would have found out that Uncle Woody's in Washington was the first restaurant of the area in the 40s to offer drive-in, drive-up, and carry-out all at the same time. Hmm. That was the first building or institution to do that in this area. That was that was really neat. So that's a hidden history now. That's pretty cool. And that's great advice for anybody looking to do something similar. Warning, this part of the show contains spoilers for the cash that is about to be discussed. So as I believe you're aware of, we do a cash highlight every episode. And you have generously agreed to do a cash highlight for us. And it is called Amen and Pass the Penicillin. Amen and Pass the Penicillin. <laughs> cash ID GC7QRMD. The description reads Peoria's Ag Lab, United States Department of Agriculture, Northern Regional Laboratory, 1938 till still operating. History. NCAUR was one of four regional labs set up by the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938 when Peoria, Illinois was chosen to host this facility named the Northern Regional Laboratory. The other regional labs set up by the 1938 Act are located in Winmore, Pennsylvania, Eastern Regional Research Center, New Orleans, Louisiana, Southern Regional Research Center, and Albany, California. Western Regional Research Center. The Northern Lab was named the National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research in 1990. The Northern Lab developed one of the first industrial production techniques for penicillin. This development was led by Andrew J. Moyer, and this early scientific accomplishment set a standard for research excellence at NCAUR generating global and enduring impact and constantly bringing credit to the United States Department of Agriculture and its Agricultural Research Service. The late agricultural researcher, Dr. Ed Bagley, who had been a professor at Washington University in St. Louis before coming to Peoria, was involved in finding new and better ways to improve the removal of carcinogens and the discontinuation of their use from corn and soy crops. Another example of their work is the development of soybeans from a small forage rotation crop to the second largest and most valuable row crop in the U.S. Operation NCAUR's 35 Current Research Projects, CRIS, are mission-driven reflecting the USDA Agricultural Research Service's national research programs, more than 250 research personnel from nearly a dozen scientific disciplines are divided into nine teams. Their charge is to use basic and applied science techniques to create ideas, knowledge, and solutions for high-priority national research programs. These scientists publish an average of 190 peer-reviewed journal publications submitted per year, frequent invitations to present findings at national and international meetings, and continued issuance of patents and licensed technology. Technology transfer is facilitated through numerous collaborations with universities, private industry, trade associations, and other government agencies. The NCAUR facility is also home to the headquarters of the Midwest Area of Agricultural Research Service, which includes ASR facilities in Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Ohio, and Wisconsin. This one, am I correct, this is part of the Hidden History series? It is a Hidden History. However, it's not going under the normal criteria to be a Hidden History in that the building is still there. What's hidden about it is that not a lot of people know about the building's relationship to penicillin back when it was first being made. That's the hidden part of the history. Okay. Okay. And um, when people find this cache, they'll understand a little better on the naming of it. That's all I'm going to say. Moo ha 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 ha. Oh, come on. Give us a hint. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could take a guess when it says amen that it, it probably 
has something to do with the church. <laughs> and you would be wrong. <laughs> I would be wrong, really. Okay, the the spoiler that I'm going to give you is it's on the fringe of a cemetery. Ah, okay. And right across the street of the building that we are actually cataloging or commemorating. Okay. It's also, as a double entendre, if you want to call it that, it's also behind a statue of Jesus Christ. Oh, nice. So, it, like I said, it'll ding once you get to it and say, <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> How did you come up with this cash? Um, well, again, I, I uncovered that in, in some other research that I was doing, that the penicillin was being mass produced through our our facility here in Peoria um, back in when it was first being made or when it first got discovered because our building, the ag building, as we call it, uh, was the only place that was able to mass produce it at that time. So, and I just remember, you know, back in history, amen and pass the ammunition. So right. <laughs> it just, it just kind of, kind of fell in line with amen and pass the penicillin. Nice. I like it. Was it. Just a, it was just a bonus that Jesus Christ happened to be standing right there. <laughs> Is this a traditional cash? No, I can't tell you everything. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. It is a traditional cache. However, it is very cleverly hidden. Okay. And I'm I'm quoting a log. I am not boasting. <laughs> it's cleverly hidden. Okay. Well, anybody looking for it, look for Jesus and start there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, thank you so much for coming on and doing this tonight. And you sent me a list that you had for all the caches in the series. So we will include that in the show notes and the link for Amen and Pass the Penicillin, of course, as well as a link to the Hidden History Facebook page. So if anybody wants to follow that and stay up to date, I'm, I'm hoping that you will post on there when you've published something new for us. I usually do. Yeah. Perfect. You've been listening to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts or on the Geocache Adventures Facebook page. And if you know any other geocachers that may like this podcast, please share it with them. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Do you have a topic you'd like to hear discussed? Do you have a geocache adventure you would like to share for the cache highlight? Would you like to be a guest on the show? Reach out to me at geocache.adventures.podcast at gmail.com or on the contact page at geocacheadventures.org. You can also check out Geocache Adventures merchandise by visiting the store page at geocacheadventures.org. You can also sign up for the Geocache Adventures newsletter by going to geocacheadventures.org and going to the newsletter page and signing up there. The monthly newsletter will include a list of upcoming podcast episodes as well as behind the episode tidbits and other content as well. Thank you for listening and I hope you've enjoyed the show.